My name is Sam Wagner. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. In this series of two videos, we are going to discuss the loaded question, was Jesus Christ a malignant narcissist? Illegitimate and adopted children, especially of humble origins, often develop narcissistic defenses to fend off persistent feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. Admittedly, it is highly unlikely that Jesus was an illegitimate child. Adulteresses in ancient Judea were stoned to death, and we know that nothing of a sort has happened to Mary. But equally there is little doubt that the circumstances of Jesus' birth were shrouded in mystery. His mother Mary got herself pregnant, but not by having sexual intercourse with her lawfully wedded husband, Joseph. So, we find that early on, Jesus develops magical thinking compensatory grandiose delusions and fantasies of omnipotence and omniscience. A firstborn, he was likely much pampered by his doting mother. He was undoubtedly a prodigy, a wunderkind, a highly intelligent and inquisitive child, and more comfortable in the company of adults than with his peers. When he was a mere twelve-year-old, we read, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Luke 2, 46. Even at this tender age of 12, Jesus showed a marked lack of empathy, and a full-fledged case of pathological grandiosity. We read this difficult uh, passage. His mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing, after he has vanished for three days. And Jesus said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wist they not that I must be about my father's business? My father in this case being God. So at the age of 12, Jesus decides that his father is not his real father, but God. And that he doesn't give a fig about the plight of his father and mother, their sorrow, their fear, apprehension and anxiety. He doesn't care, simply. Gurus at the center of emergent cults are inevitably narcissistic if not outright narcissists. The self-imputation of superiority, epiphanic knowledge and infallibility, and the assumption that others need and crave the Guru's message are at the heart of an elaborate construct which borders on the psychotic. We read, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Matthew 7, 28. Referring to his twelve disciples, Jesus made clear the, and lay down the law. The, the disciple is not above his master, nor is the servant above his lord. Matthew 10, 24. And Jesus goes further than that. He says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10, 37. And here is how Jesus, at this stage a lowly, unmarried, and itinerant son of a carpenter, in other words, an abysmal and abject failure by the standards of his own society, here is how he views himself, nothing to do with reality. He says, when the Son of Man, talking about himself, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 25, 31 and 46. When there are murmurs of doubt regarding this stupendously grandiose claims which bear, which, which are completely incommensurate with Jesus' real life and, and meager and lacking accomplishments, so when people, you know, raise eyebrows, he erupts. Jesus rages and says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Matthew 26, 53. Contrary to his much-cultivated image, 
Jesus, like the vast majority of cult leaders, actually lacked empathy. He was a heartless and irresponsible manipulator, whose magical thinking ruined the lives of many. He instructed his followers to commit acts that must have had harshly adverse impact on their hitherto nearest and dearest. Jesus monopolized the lives of his disciples to the exclusion of all else and all others, and he admits it freely. He says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Matthew 10.35 Jesus applied this extremely cruel, calculated, heartless rule to his own family. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But Jesus answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. Matthew 12:47. And Jesus, walking the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a sheep with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the sheep and their father, and followed him. Matthew 4, 18. Consider the disastrous effects their actions have had on their fathers and their families now left effectively to starve. To Jesus, evidently, these were absolutely irrelevant considerations. Jesus healed only those who visibly, volubly, clearly, publicly, and repeatedly worshipped him. In other words, he extended his gift of healing and curing only to his sources of narcissistic supply and to no one else. There are numerous instances in the four canonical Gospels where Jesus actually bargains with the diseased, with the afflicted, with the sick, and demands, sometimes in, in anger and fury, their unconditional adoration. He is happiest when acknowledged and affirmed as Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Those who do not recognize his splendid grandeur, unbound might, implied divinity, he calls dogs and swine. Matthew 7, 6. His much-touted love of the poor was not a match for his malignant self-love. When his disciples upbraided a woman for anointing Jesus with expensive ointment because they thought the money could have been better used to help the poor, the great humanist Jesus has this to say. Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. In other words, she did well, having spent this enormous amount of money on oil for Jesus' hair, rather than to help the poor. Uh, interesting uh, order of priorities for uh, someone claiming to be uh, Christ and the Son of God. In the next uh, video, in the second part of this video, we will discuss other facets of Jesus' personality and mission on earth.